one of them opportunity to present myself today. And my thanks also goes to my lovely wife, Andrea. The dog will now not be here with this day. Don't get confused, sir. Uh, this is the rest of the story because that's the name she wrote my story on the land as I did it. Her primary name. I guess I'm here to tell my unique story. I trained as a civil engineer. I was very fortunate to start in my line of study shortly afterwards. Um, having, <coughs> having met all my obligations in society at the time. Um, these are very first eventful years. It went well. Uh, I started off life well in an environment away from everyone I knew. I was with a lot of young men. I was uh, in a long term relationship at university. Unfortunately, my new circumstances led to break up this relationship, this very strong attachment I had. I got to learn that two years is a very long time in the life of a Samson. In life of a young man. Um, so I did the breakdown of myself in as a result of multiple instances of life's, well, life's most stressful stations actually, within a short space of time for a young person like me at that time. So my long term girlfriend broke up with me, which was very traumatic because back then we were already engaged. Within a year of this, I became a first time life. Within nine months of getting on the house ladder, I was able to travel out of the country uh, to visit my parents for the first time since leaving home. It was a short holiday with my father, I prevailed on me to remain at home. And of course, I told him, well, at home I didn't have a job, there weren't any prospects, you didn't have the complete contacts which were going to help me at the time. And I'd done fairly well, I'd done a lot better than I would have if I stayed. How did I know that I was going to start heading home within three months of that? So, um, stress out of work uh, resulting from rich enthusiasm on my part. I always wanted to get things done. My manager called me instead, my just man. So I was very, very uh, quick call from that. And difficult to the support of it. Um, that's what I think one of the emotional challenges I faced at the time. Resulting in a friend of mine finally collapsed in, in my flat. After I'd gone to the GPs to get a tetanus injection, uh, my friend telephoned my dad. We talked, and my dad convinced me, prevailed on me to come home and just leave everything and come back and sort myself out afterwards. So he got a, uh, if I, my friend got, um, he bought a ticket for me, he ordered a flight for me, and I had to go into the uh, back to. I was not strong enough to write out a check in full as I signed. So with hindsight, I wasn't in a fit position to travel. But uh, I went with him and he looked after me the night before I traveled. And the following morning, he said, just took me to the airport. I got to the airport and I attempted to the board and collapsed. Now, um, an assessment was made by the emergency services staying police at the time, a few questions asked here and there. And I was about to get to the time, that's the kind of get, but I was about to get to the time uh, to a place where I finally found I was in the hospital in town. Uh, not to go into a long story, you can find, you can find out the story, the left of the story in my wife's book. But basically, um, basically, I was very fortunate because since then, uh, for that time, for a long period of time, I was in continuous employment after that. For the next few years, I was never promoted, but I thoroughly enjoyed my professional work. I was learning about the change in medication that I was given in 1999, which was about uh, seven years or eight years into, into my journey, was as a result of the, the change in diagnosis of schizophrenia. By that time, I had to cope with loans. My mom was now restricted from coming to the country. I uh, had several attempts to enter. Uh, I had made good refusal, probably because she had a state at last season. And I had, had one, I was one to prevail not to go home. Um, it was going to be more than 10 years before she could ever come to the UK again. So, being on medication for schizophrenia, you said my perspective on how I did it with my environment. I bought books on many areas of interest, 
intended to read them. Yes, Sweden was a great company of mine when I was young. Younger, right? Um, <laughs> but years passed the time I opened a single page of those books. So how did time go? Uh, so there were little things like uncompleted sentences in my writings too, especially when I was taking notes. I would jump one task without either completely finishing the task that I had or leaving it in a, in a time to stay together to get on to the next, the next thing. So this left a trail of disorder and destruction. That kind of disorder in my way as there were there are a lot of completely demand for interest or for my attention. It, it left that, that trail there. So I met my wife Zoe 14 years into my journey in the mental health system. So uh, I'm not the type of person to try and give a false impression as she saw me as I was. Things began to change. I found out that probably is a very important medicine, so it makes you relax and uh, so it started by trying to take Knew myself of medication. It wasn't easy. Uh, I made I had made many attempts in the past to do so, but only resulted in maybe every day and ended up in hospital. So I was, I was to find out later my body had become very dependent on this medication. I, I could not function without it. That's something I didn't accept at the time. So I also had a very strong support system after I met my wife, um, our church family, my family in particular, my mother. I've mentioned before. And also my mother in law was very sure, very inspiring. This is very, very in African settings. So my mother in law had a few encouraged her, her daughter to marry me after she has witnessed one of the episodes I had. This is very, very rare. So it was a journey of faith to come off you know, the mental health system. I was always worried to believe that you got well enough after taking medication because medication is supposed to make you get well and you don't need the medication afterwards. Uh, what I hadn't realized at the time was that as and psychotics I was on was as addictive as a lagaxi in my mind. Mom had fought very strenuously to get me off within a month of being discharged from Nathan Hospital. She had succeeded by getting on to Saroxa, which was later changed to Prozac, before they got an admission in 1999, when I was facing psychotics. So stress sensations were often a trigger to an episode that time. Uh, and don't be up, be not being ill in hospital. In the other day, uh, generally, we would be expressed as pain, very severe pain, mental pain. I couldn't really function. My gut was supposed to run to um, my GPs, and after severe pain, I'd find myself in hospital with assessing and putting me into our unit. So um, I don't have time to. <laughs> elaborate on all this. But uh, when I expressed it inside to my wife that I wanted to get off this medication, she advised me uh, I should stop the medication and stay used. I wanted to stop this because of the um, side effects, the bad things that were happening. I increasingly gained weight. I tried several times to go to the uh, heart gym membership to get that done. I had problems with cholesterol. And I was increasingly getting drowsy at meetings. Even though I was very keen on what I was doing, I could not keep awake for more than 20 minutes. Like, I sat down and I was in this class and listened to the meeting. So, she forgot me weaning myself gradually off the medication, which is precisely what we did. So, um, I'll, I'll not elaborate more on this, but I'll, say that I'll conclude by saying that I was happy to discharge the clean been upheld by a consultant psychiatrist, following this success within myself of uh, antipsychotic medication, which I've been on for 10 years at the time. Um, not continuously, uh, because as I said before, I'd go out on this medication, I'd feel well, and I'd ask questions, when am I going to get on this medication? I never get an answer. So eventually, when I felt it was, I was okay to get off it anyway, get off it. Not realizing that the venture will happen that day. Yeah. So that was, that was my story. So, <coughs> what led to my being off of the uh, mental health system was um, stresses at work and challenges at work. So, 
what looks like a conspiracy <laughs> actually turned out for what came out to be a comeback. Um, the pressures, the invaders at work led me to demand a review of my health status. Because at, at the time I didn't actually know what was on my, what was the last thing on my, on my diagnosis. Because no one told me. So, um, effectively what they were saying was I wasn't I was meant to be on medication. I've not taken the medication. I've not taken the medication for a while. Uh, I felt I didn't need the medication. So, someone had to do the assessment. So eventually I went, um, because of the pressures, I went to my GPs and requested a, a diagnosis. I requested a, an assessment. So the assessment was done, the, by that time we had moved. So we moved from where I was living, we moved to another place. And I'd been going for the medication until uh, at that time I thought I didn't need to go up to it. And from there records you could see Actually, I had been going for that medication for a while. So, not going to long story. Uh, the psychiatrist assessed us, uh, assessed me, we had to interview me, and then called for me, for my wife to come at the next uh, interview. Had an assessment, requested for my father's from, requested for the reason for the diagnosis the first time which was forthcoming. And then we decided that it's, you know what, you've got, uh, you've got a copy of the, of the PDF from the psychiatrist. He finally stated that there was no, he couldn't identify any mental illness. Um, that the risk was very low, although I don't know the mental health would be high. And that um, he put it down to how I manage stress and said that in the future I should uh, deal with it better with my wife and things like that. But after 18 years, I was finally signed off. Wow. So I guess I'm not going to be able to do it if I had the junior status. Was that actually at the consultant psychiatric space that? He asked me, do you know what schizophrenia is? So, uh, that was when I discovered that I was what was actually placed in 1999 by my So, um, I've been living a very healthy life without medication for more than five years now. Not only that, I went through a very stressful time of redundancy, so which I was a casualty. One of the people who was made redundant fucked himself. Um, so, Stress is repeatedly, or being repeatedly rejected for more than 200 job applications in the four years following my last employment, and more than 20 interviews in the last four years. Uh, I've also been successfully worded without my being ill again or going back to medication. So uh, I guess I've defined the cause of medical or of mental illness, so it can be done. I'm not saying that people should stop their medication, but it can be done. And I'm here to say that it can be done. So there's so much to talk about surrounding the issues of mental illness. It sounds like it has to how I ended up in the mental health system. Was I misdiagnosed? And I think, well, as I think I've been in the first place. But when the final consultant psychiatrist finally reported and had the diagnosis that were coming by, you see the response. My life on medication and probably observation will have been my lot for the rest of my life. I may not be here as well. It will not be for faith, love, and tenacity. Yeah. Yeah. So when you think that one of the side effects of taking uh, that medication I that is listed as hallucination, so one and two one how I'll actually find the others. As I said, I'm not on the page of your common medication tonight if you want medication. But uh, faith, tenacity, and love won't again. So it's an achievable journey, and I want to give everyone hope tonight. So today, Zoe and I have an organization called Define Mental Illness, which is a registered CIC. So you can visit our sites and get our books. So one other thing is that if I run alone, I will run fast, but if I run with others, I can cover a lot more distance. Yeah. Yeah. And we do need to cover a lot more distance. Let us know what organizations are If you can stand up a bit, so you can say,
2016. It says uh, risk low, CPL level statement of care, uh, medication not known. So it's, it does, that's precisely what I have. So thank you for taking time to listen to me. And uh, don't forget, just a look. The question is this. Now, the people giving our drugs to uh, maintain now and ask them the question what kind of drugs have they been giving to her that she's still a kind of aggressive is she not speaking out to you is she not explaining because she's been telling me something that she said she could not talk to others so in this situation which what is the best way for someone to let the authority that is taking care of her to know that she's not actually opening up she's still having that no she's still nursing that Bitterness or whatever. What is the best way to uh, I like the I like the uh, government to know that this person is not really doing the right thing? My short answer would be seek her consent and go along to an appointment with her where you can have a discussion or point her in the direction of a wider support network. Um, it's not not a question I can answer in a short space of time, but she definitely needs ongoing support and possibly from a wider source. I just want to quickly point out something in response to one of the questions earlier, that medication is usually indicated in moderate to severe symptoms. I'm not saying the GP should not prescribe. I just mean if the symptoms are mild, it may be that there are other interventions as a first line of, it, of, um, of intervention. I'm wondering, do we have statistics as to people who have come to full recovery. My experience is that people just keep on on medication off and on and we really I don't have the uh, statistics. But do we have an idea of how many people do come to full recovery and particularly what is it that has become so difficult for people with mental health to come to a state of full recovery? Do you want to take that up there? Can you just answer that question? Specifically in, in relation to psychotic illnesses and schizophrenia, um, there's a rule of thirds. So with people that develop a psychotic illness, one third of them will have, as, as a younger person, one third will have a couple of episodes which remain and last it for life. They never have a relapse. Another one third will have on and off episodes where they function completely well in between episodes but when they are well they are very unwell. And the final one third will have repeated episodes where unfortunately they never return to their base level line of functioning. They are always functioning below their usual what you would like, expect as normal for someone of, of their age and, and, and background. So it, it's a rule of thirds. With mental illness, we are often exposed to people who fall in the second and the third groups. So those who have um, uh, one or two episodes as young people and never have it again, we don't get to hear about them. So people do come off their medication, it's possible, but it should always be done in conjunction with um, the mental health professionals. There should be open communication. Yeah, thank you so much. Glad for this opportunity. In response to that, when I met Ethan, Ethan had been 14 years in the mental health system. So it wasn't a case, I don't know the circumstances, because Ethan was on his way traveling to Nigeria, the very first time that he collapsed. And the next thing he finds himself straight in the mental health system. I don't understand how that could ever have even happened in modern today's health system. Because I do not believe that if somebody collapsed in an airport, they would find themselves in the mental health hospital. And his mother being a nurse, she flew in a week afterwards and was able to, you know, assess her rights and say, this and this and this should not be done. In terms of whether Ezra belonged to the third or not, when I met Ezra, he was highly dependent on the antipsychotic um, medication. And for us personally, I cannot downplay the role of the support system that we had, our faith, our church, and I think my role as well as a wife. Mm -hmm. Because when I saw Eze just before we got engaged, just before we got married, Eze got ill. Mm -hmm. 
And as you said, my mother was the one who actually encouraged me to still go ahead. And basically, the doctor at that particular point in time said that Evan was never in his lifetime dream of ever coming off that medication. I was there when I said that in the hospital. But four years after I married him, in fact, two years after I married him, Evan came off the medication. But it took tenacity, faith, and determination for us to get to that point. The medication actually gets your body to function, um, to function as, as best as it can. But it doesn't, it doesn't uh, if you remove it, you have to have some support. So what I had was the support I had. Uh, because at that, it's like, it's like, okay, something that you're addicted to. You're, if you're sticking out from the... Yeah. Um, I was beginning to suspect from your story that you were wrongly diagnosed or what do you call it? I'm sorry, I'm pronouncing some things. Could it be the medication they gave you? That's yeah, because it looks as if you fainted. So why mental hospital? It could yeah, be the was... because I'm just talking. Because I, I've had a breakdown. That was eight years ago. And the medication they gave me, all it does is just make you useless. No. No. Yeah, it's, it's a tranquilizer. Very strong tranquilizer. That's what they give. Morning, That's what they gave me morning. at the hospital. Can you wake up? It's morning, mom. I can't ever forget this. I started crying because I, I had to. Yeah, I had to. want to, authorities are here, these medications, they are very, very dangerous. I, what I suffered actually was more of abuse. Nothing was wrong with me because whether we like it or not, we all have this instinct within us. Some are strong, some are vocal. It's just a force that pushes everyone. But then I was, my ex said I was sick. I needed someone to pray for me. And after that one prayed for me, I became sick. But God delivered me. What I'm trying to just, uh, what I was asking, what my conviction, I'm sorry, is that nothing was wrong with him, but the medication made him ill. And uh, I'm just going to quickly lay background to what I want to say. Um, I'm a pharmacist, and uh, 20 years. And I have a spell of time in Oxy's NHS Trust for 10 months, which is a mental health psychiatric unit in Dexter. And I was actually going to do a specialty in psychiatric pharmacy. But I then backed out because of <laughs> all the stories after 10 months. But in my journey as a pharmacist, I've actually had it. My son had a breakdown. And while, when he had the breakdown, the obvious obvious thing to do, and this is what we do, and I don't know whether Leah would agree with me, the agitation and aggression sometimes that we experience as healthcare professionals, and that includes the doctors, the nurses, and everyone who's working with you, we can control them by giving you what you call the tranquilizers. We don't call them tranquilizers anymore. You know, the antipsychotics, I call them, but we're under the mental health or mental illness. There's so many um, medications that you use that are not actually antipsychotics. Okay, and I'm going to use my son as an example. When he had his breakdown, and if you remember from Leah's slide, he talked about the mood swings and the mood issue from one mood to another and everything. And I knew what he, I wanted a first and foremost, I'm a pharmacist, I can't diagnose. So I wanted a psychiatrist to tell me what is going on, what am I dealing with, what do we have here, what exactly do we have? 
So we met a psychiatrist. We, I, first and foremost, I, my first approach was as a Christian, this is an attack. Okay? So I went from that route first. And then having done the, oh, this is an attack, prayer, and everything, thing, I then put my men at the cap of a, 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 a professional on and realized I still needed a psychiatrist to evaluate and tell me what's going on. And the first psychiatrist we saw was in Nigeria. And what he gave me, I looked at the prescription and I said, no, this is not it. This is not what my son needs. I look because I know what this I know what he's given. I understand why he's, he's giving it to me because I've got a full grown teenage boy and this is me trying to control him. He's extremely agitated, he needs to be controlled and everything like that. And all I all, all I was doing as his mother was putting him on my back literally and you know, trying to say, Look, I'm here. If you want to be aggressive, I'm here. Do you understand? Where other people could know, they're thinking, just give him the medication and that, that would calm him down. But I know if I go down that room, that's the end of my son. Do you understand? Because I know the impact of these things on him. So I didn't give him these things. So we came back to England. When we came back to England, my GP said to us, Mr. Sosa, if I don't know who you are, I will be calling this, the social services and telling them to come and take this spot. And I said, Dr. Nataraja, look at me. If they come in to take my son, I've lost him to the system. Because that's what I know would happen. I know what they would do. The first thing they do is they give him that psychotic, knock him down. And once he's knocked down, every time he wants to come back up, they give him more. Every time he wants, they're going to give him more. So I know that's not what we need here. So we saw another psychiatrist, and this other psychiatrist looked and said, and he did a very thorough one, and said, I can't see psychosis. I said, thank you. There's no psychosis here. What we have is, we have a mood thing going on. And as soon as he said to me, we have no psychosis because he's still, he's inside his cell, he's functioning, his thoughts are making sense. There's no psychosis inside this. I said, that's all I need because I'm not a doctor. There's no psychosis. What do we have? Mood. As soon as he mentioned, I need, well, okay, what we need is the mood stabilizers. I need to stabilize his mood. So what do we need? And I said to him, I said, have you used this particular, have you used the faculty before? And so, yeah, I've used the faculty. I said, what dose are we starting at? So we started on the faculty. And he wouldn't have an antipsychotic. Okay, because we both agreed he didn't need one. Okay, so we went home and started, started on the faculty. And, I, and every time I looked, I said, okay, I'm doing 1,500 the faculty. Um, no, no, no. He was getting ready to drop his car. Doctor, what do I do? Drop it down by 250 milligrams. Blah, blah, blah. We were doing that. Never saw anyone through the GP. So at some point, we, we, the GP got to know we were doing that. Private prescription to the GP, it, um, and he would give us an NHS prescription because he needed to do some tests. While he's using the faculty, he has to keep his liver function tests be going on and things like that. So that he sort of managed, we were able to manage that. But then she mentioned something about trigger factors. I have, my brother is a consultant, happiness and emergency. My brother said something to me. Psychiatry does not just psychosis does not start, start like that. A mood, depressing mood, can actually take you into if you don't if you don't treat a mood, if you don't take care of your depression, if depression continues this is endlessly. Another day. So what I'm trying to say to you, I'm sorry, I'm not I don't want to take your time. Antipsychotic, possibly in those days, Leah would agree with me. Mental health has gone through a real change. We've gone through, we're going around. So what we started in what might be something that makes him, you know, tranquilize. We don't use that word anymore. There's no tranquilizers anymore. Okay? But if you need to use medicine, I will say this to you. In consultation, she said, collaborative talk with your psychiatrist, with your pharmacy. Go to them and say, I'm having this side effect. Thank you.